Hello, Oscillator Sync here. One of the things I really appreciate about Electron Boxes, and I guess the Digitone in particular, is that it provides you with a very strict, well-defined set of tools and concepts to work within. And although you're kind of boxed in to these ideas, what you can do with them is only really limited by your imagination. It, it's kind of like having a, a, a children's play area. It's fenced in, you've got a set off play equipment to ensure you can slide down the slide and you could go on the seesaw and you could swing on the swings but there's nothing stopping you using those swings as a bridge or hiding under the, the slide as, as a den what you actually do is only really limited by your imagination and that's kind of how i feel about the digitone that being said that level of freedom and control does allow you to do things which lead to undesirable results. And one such undesirable result that I see people talk about is the fact that they are getting undesirable clicks in their sound while they are uh, working with especially more complex arrangements on the digitone. So I thought um, in this video, it's a good opportunity to talk about the uh, Venn diagram of sound design and voice management. And there's quite a big crossover in the middle of that Venn diagram, which uh, is uh, or could be responsible for causing those clicks. Uh, and by understanding how these concepts within the box actually work and understanding what causes these unpleasant clicks, uh, we can learn how to mitigate against them as well. So I thought I'd begin with the simplest concept in terms of um, going hunting for clicks. And it's also the concept which lives purely within the sound design um, aspects of the Digitone. We don't need to worry about voice management at all here. And that is simply that on the amp envelope, um, the amp envelope, when you turn your attack or release or indeed decay down to zero, it is incredibly, incredibly fast. So fast that it will shear off waveforms which will then cause a click. So if we have our attack and release down to zero, which is a perfectly reasonable thing to do on a lot of synths to get uh, an organ style attack sort of gated on and off. If you do that on the Digitone, you can hear that there's quite a harsh click, especially at the end there, and it gets worse on lower notes typically as well. So the easy fix for this is just to not have your attack and release set at zero unless you particularly want that instant onset with that click which can be useful for percussive sounds and actually on the digitone anything up to about 10 uh on the attack and release will still sound pretty much instant but just dropping it down to say about four still a tiny bit of a click there but less of an offensive one, more of an attack to it, you will get rid of that that nasty click there. So that's the straightforward one. And if you're getting clicks in your sounds, then definitely check that uh, no part of your amp envelope is set to zero. So for all the other concepts we'll be discussing uh, today, we are going to be thinking uh, a little bit about the voice management, the voice allocation on the Digitone, which is to say how the eight voices that are available are being allocated to the notes that are being played. So um, to that end, we'll be spending a little bit of time in the voice menu here, and we'll talk a, a bit about what all of these various parameters are doing. But just to begin with, I just want to draw your attention to the um, eight boxes up at the top there. The eight boxes at the top there represent the eight voices on the Digitone. So as I play a note, one of those boxes gets filled in. And as I continue to hold down more notes and play more notes, they're going to fill up to the point where we have eight notes playing and all of our voices are being allocated. Now, if we play those eight notes and then um, play a ninth note, just keep an eye on um, on this, that row of boxes and as I play this extra note, you'll notice that there is a, see that there, a rectangle that got um, placed around, let's try again, play another note, around the, the voices there. And what that tells you is that at that point, a voice has been stolen. And um, in the settings that we currently have here, that means that a newer note has replaced an older note. And you would hear that some of the original notes have dropped out. Now, this is not always totally um, truthful in what you see here. Uh, and I'll give you an example. If I put on a very, very long, well, infinite, in fact, um, envelope here. So these notes will now sustain forever without me having to hold down. 
you'll notice that I'm playing in all these notes, but the boxes aren't staying filled because those notes are not currently being held down. So this isn't a represent representation of the voices that are being played, it's a, a representation of the voices that are currently being held down. And if I play another note now, a voice has definitely been stolen, uh, but we don't get that visual feedback on here. And I think maybe it would be useful if you did, but um, that is what it is in this case. As I say, we'll come back to this a little bit and talk uh, about what we're seeing here as we explore some of the other concepts. So I'd like to move on and talk about probably one of the most jarring uh, times where you get um, a, a nasty click, which is on nice, lovely, luxurious pad sounds. So I'll give you an example here. If I um, play down this note here, fades in, and it's got a very long release on it. Lovely. Now if I go to play that note again, you might have heard that there was a click there. That is a bad click on a uh, lovely pad sound, especially as that click also gets echoed through your reverb and delay, meaning that your error is held out even longer uh, than it would have been otherwise. So the reason that, that this click is happening on this initialized patch is actually down to um, two different um, settings. So if we go first over to the voice management here, and I play in this C note here. Now when I play it again, you'll notice that it's the same square that's getting lit up, which means that it's the same voice which is playing this note over and over again. The reason that's important if we go over to our amp envelope, um, sorry, our amp page two, is this setting here, which is the amp uh, envelope um, restart, a reset rather. Um, while this is on, whenever this voice, which as we know is the same voice over and over again, gets re-triggered, it's going to hard reset this amp, amp, amp envelope, which means that we could be in the middle of this sustain here, and it will immediately drop to zero, which is going to cause a click, because again, you have that hard cutoff of your sound. So there are two ways we can look at to reduce this click. The first lives purely within the voice um, management here. So the reason that the same voice is being used over and over again for the same note is because this parameter here, this reuse parameter, is turned on. And actually, if we turn it off, play that note in, play it again, we're not getting a click because actually that note is now being played three times, but on different voices. Now, that's not to say that we can't get a click this way. And actually, if we play in eight of these notes in quick succession, we'll start getting clicks afterwards. Uh, they're not quite as obvious because you've got all the other voices going on at the same time. The downside of turning off reuse is that, um, well, it's kind of what you're seeing right here, is that when you have the same note being played multiple times, it's going to move to another voice, which actually means you're going to be stealing voices more quickly. Um, with it turned on, if I play um, that C chord there and then play a another chord and then another chord. We're not getting so much voice stealing happening, whereas here if I play it, we'll be hitting that um, hard cut off a lot sooner. But for some arrangements, um, that's going to be a perfectly fine way of dealing with this voice um, stealing clicking. The other way of dealing with it lives more within the sound design um, side of things. So as I noted, the fact that this um, reset is turned on, just to make sure that's back on reuse, yep. So the, the fact that this reset is back on is what's causing our envelope to jump back to the start. So you might well think, well, if I turn that off, all of my problems will go away. However, if anything, they've got worse. 
which is surprising. Because what's happening now is that our amp envelope is starting, it's playing, and if we um, hit it again, sort of somewhere in sustain, it's just going to start from that sustain level, attack a little bit, and then carry on along its merry way. But for some reason, our click is now much, much worse, which is the opposite of what we wanted. Now, the reason that is happening is actually uh, over here in page two of synth two. And it's this parameter here, which is our phase reset. Now at the moment, and on the default um, initialized patch, it's gonna be set to all. What this means is that every single um, operator that we have in our algorithm, whenever a new note is played, it will hard reset the phase. So it will start um, back at the, the center of the graph of your sine wave, if you like. This is even worse than our envelope resetting quickly because this is always, almost always going to create a very, very hard um, pop as the um, operator jumps from wherever it is in its cycle back to the zero point. So it it's as bad, if not worse, as what we already had with our amp envelope. So to fix this problem, we have to turn off the phase reset and you have different types of phase reset on here. Um, and depending on how your sound is working, um, anything other than uh, all or C is probably fine. Um, a plus B will be a problem um, if you have got your mix turned up on this algorithm because you've got um, B1 coming through here. A plus B2 will usually be safe, again, depending on the algorithm. Basically, you don't want to be phase resetting any of the operators that you're hearing directly. The easiest way to do that is to go to off. So now if we play those notes multiple times, we're not getting a click because our amp is not resetting and neither is our operator. So we can happily play chords which involve the same notes um, and we're not going to get that click and we're also not going to be using up our voices so quickly because we're still going to be using the same voices for the same notes so that's my usual chosen way of getting rid of clicks um, on pad sounds Okay, so let's dive back into the voice allocation and talk about some other um, settings in here that if you're not um, careful can lead to some undesirable results. So this setup here is what you will have on an initialized patch. So the voice steam will be set to um, cycle. Um, uh, the reuse will be turned on for all of the different um, parts by default and the locked voices will be set to dynamic for every uh, track as well which means that um, currently as set up, each of the four different um, tracks are all sharing th a, the common pool of eight uh, voices that are available. So I'm gonna set up something that's slightly contrived to prove a point, but um, um, hopefully you'll be able to sort of abstract this contrived uh, idea and see how it applies to a, to a more realistic arrangement. So. Um, on track one here, I've got um, this bass sound. It's got a big long decay at the moment. That's not going to matter because um, what we're going to do is on uh, step one, we're going to stick a nice long sort of full bar trick there. So we've basically just got a bass note there that's pulsing away. Cool. So uh, over on sound four, kind of got this uh, reedy, paddy sound. Uh, so um, again, going to be slightly contrived here for the sake of proving uh, the point. So I'll set all of the um, step uh, tricks to be fairly long, 12 steps or something like that will be fine. And I'll just on each of these... steps just put uh, a long note and we'll just build up uh, a big 
record. Something like that will be fine. So if we just mute track one, just have a listen to the cacophony we've created here. Uh, what that uh, actually is doesn't really matter. Um, but uh, what you will notice is that we have eight steps here, and by the time we get to step nine, and because of the length of each of these being 12, all eight of these steps are playing. So um, without track four in there, we've got our bass note here, which is what's grounding our arrangement. And on track four, we've got uh, that um, sort of paddy sound up at the top. So if we bring track four in, Did you hear what happened there on step eight? So the reason that's happening is that by the time we get to step eight, we have all of our steps playing. And because we're using uh, the dynamic allocation, our bass note is being stolen, which is not what we want from an arrangement point of view. Obviously, um, uh, you probably wouldn't <laughs> have an arrangement that sounds like that, but you can uh, probably see how across the four tracks and a, and a more sort of realistic arrangement, it's quite likely that you would get to the point where you would hit that eighth note. Um, now, the reason that our bass note is being killed off here is because of our voice stealing mode here. And uh, by default, it's set to cycle. And what cycle means is that the oldest note that's currently playing is the one that will be stolen when another note is required. Because our bass note is on step one, uh, it's that note which is being um, stolen. So um, let's see what happens uh, when we use um, some of the other modes here. So if we move over to track. Our bass note is no longer being stolen. So the reason that our bass note is no longer being stolen when we have this voice stealing set to track is because in track mode, and this is a global setting, this isn't something that's different per track, it's uh, a global setting within the uh, voice allocation here. Um, when voice stealing is set to track, then track one always has preference over track two, and track three, uh, track two has preference over track three, and track three has preference over track four. So um, track four is the lowest priority for voice stealing. So if any of the lower tracks um, require a voice, or to put it another way, if track four needs another voice, it can only steal from itself. Track three uh, can steal from itself, or track four. Track two can steal from itself. Track two or track four, and track one can steal from any of them. So from a, uh, an arrangement perspective, uh, if you've got uh, an element that needs to always be playing and never be stolen by any of the other parts, um, then having um, track voice stealing turned on and having your most important elements on track one and your least important elements on track four, you can be assured that you're not going to um, lose uh, the, the important elements to voice stealing when you're using dynamic voice stealing, uh, dynamic voice allocation. Uh, as it happens, if we set our voice stealing to low, we should also be safe. Apparently not. Yeah, sorry, I've gotten the wrong way around. Um, yeah, wrong way around. I always get this the wrong way around. Uh, on low mode, then uh, low notes will always be stolen first which is why our bass note, which was lower than any of our pad notes, got stolen. Um, and on high mode, the higher notes will be stolen first, which will always leave your bass intact. So if you're working um, with a complex arrangement across multiple tracks where that low end is really, really important to you, for example, you probably want to have your voice stealing set to high to make sure that your low notes um, don't get eaten up. I think what will be happening here in our chord it's not actually that first C that's getting stolen I think it's the note that played just before but yeah 
having using the correct voice stealing mode um, and thinking about what elements you put on which tracks um, can uh, save you from some clicks and worse still some embarrassing gaps in your arrangement. Okay, let's try something subtly different uh, that uh, allows me to demonstrate a slightly different concept. So I've, I've set the voice um, allocation back to the default and um, my bass sound actually has a very long decay so I don't really need to hold it out for that entire time. I can just play it at the start of the, the bar there and let it decay naturally which is a nice sound. I always think that the natural decay on a nice low sign on the digger tone kind of sounds like a low pass gate. Anyway, I digress. So again, we've got this nice pulse. It's a little gentler now because we're not holding it out that entire time because we don't need to because of the, the sound design that we've done here. So I'll come back over to our pad sound on uh, track four. We'll, we'll do something slightly different. And that is I'll put uh, a couple of chords down instead. So um, let's put a C major seven there and a F major seven there and maybe a D minor seven or something there. We're not trying to create revolutionary music here, just uh, just prove a, a point a little bit. Um, these will still be really, really long. They don't need to be as long now. It's got a long tail on it anyway. So to, to three-ish, that'd be fine. Okay, so without track four again, we've got our nice pulsing bass here. With its gentle decay, very nice. So let's bring this in. And you can hear again that our bass note is being killed off in terms of the way that it's being dynamically assigned. So you may be thinking, well, we've discussed this already. Um, why not set our voice stealing to track or high to uh, solve this problem? So let's give that a go. Sadly, that doesn't work. And the reason that doesn't work is that these voice stealing modes only apply to notes that are being held down and played. So because our bass note here um, is being played on step one, but then is actually not being held down anymore, uh, uh, it's just decaying naturally just because of its amp envelope, it's no longer giving, being given preferential treatment depending on how we set up our voice stealing. And it doesn't matter how we set it up, that note is always going to be killed off because there are so many uh, notes in the chords that have been played on track four. So what can we do in this case to make sure that our bass note doesn't get um, stolen? Uh, well, that's where the locked voices come in. So um, as I said before, um, by default, everything's set to dynamic, which means that everything is sharing that common pool of um, voices. But you can say on a per track basis, and again, it's, it's a, unlike the um, uh, the other stuff on here, which is kind of um, global with the voice stealing, uh, with our lock voices, it's a per um, per track thing. So on track one, which is our bass note, it now says one, which means I have said that there is one voice uh, within this pool of, um, of voices uh, that is reserved exclusively for this track. So that means two things. One, this track can never steal from any of the other tracks, which is good. Uh, uh, and two, uh, none of the other tracks can steal from this one. So now if we hit play, you can hear that our bass note is being sustained, or rather is continuing to decay naturally, despite the busyness on our chords here. And I think for me, usually using locked voices is the more um, natural way of working. Um, and you can think about what you're trying to achieve on a sort of per track basis to make sure that um, you lock things in a sensible way. So we might say that, okay, well, this we're going to treat as a monophonic bass part so we can lock it to just one. Um, this one we happen to know is playing um, four note chords. Now, if we set this one to four, they're going to 
cut off every single time because they're each four note chords but you can do stuff with uh, the rest of your synthesis to make that smoother situation perhaps depending on what you're trying to uh, achieve of course um, and of course uh, this sort of setup and locking voices in appropriate ways across your tracks um, and working with those constraints in a more sort of tightly focused way is a, a really good way of um, uh, a getting the sort of uh, sonic result that you're looking for but I think also it does um, focus the mind a little bit um, uh, and you think a little bit more about um, your arrangement in terms of the technical constraints of the digger tone as well which i think is a good thing often you can also use these locked voices um as a as a sound design tool as well so for example um if i wanted to create like a glitchy drum track and i had lots of different drum sounds uh, for sure i would lock that drum track to being just one voice so that each new drum hit completely cut off that last one giving you that kind sort of glitchy break um sound um, without having to do any additional work uh, because by default, if you had that on dynamic and you wanted to pitch the different drums different ways, they would get uh, assigned different voices, which means that one uh, one drum hit would sustain across the other, whereas locking it exclusively uh, is going to get you into a much more glitchy um, uh, situation, if that's what you're looking for, of course. So the last little area I want to explore um, when it comes to um, the voice allocation side of things is, is kind of a, a side note, um, because it's not going to necessarily help with... Uh, clicks and the like but it is worth um, exploring um, especially for certain types of patches so um, I'm back on uh, my bass sound here um, and I'll just unlock it quickly uh, so it's back to dynamic voice allocation so this is a bass sound and it's kind of a classic sort of mono kind of sound so you would expect to be able to play it like a mono synth obviously if we don't um, constrain the number of voices it's going to use then it's um, kind of play polyphonically so if we want to make this a bit more like a mono synth obviously the the easy thing to do would be to lock it to one voice so and we kind of get that kind of mono vibe from it now but it doesn't really play like a mono synth because um, it doesn't exhibit any note priority uh, which is to say if I play a note and then play another note my expectation generally speaking on a mono synth it depends on what type of synth it is my expectation would be that i'd be able to release this high note and my low note would then continue playing but it doesn't um, because what we really have here is a polysynth that only has one voice and that's how it's acting so um, one i think maybe overlooked aspect of um, the setup menu so shift and trick um, is down here in the play mode so by default this will be set to poly which gives us the behavior we were seeing there uh, we have poly with mono lfo which um, is really useful for um oh, perhaps i'll show you in a second actually um for, for, for cheesy organ patches that's where i would use it um but um importantly we have mono and mono legato and we have then access to different note priorities so now if i i get that mono synth behavior that i would expect to get um, at the moment you're here as i play each note it's kind of starting again from the start of the envelope and we're getting that attack if we lower that a bit more you'll hear a bit more too much we're gonna click there we go you can hear that we're getting that um, definite attack at the start of each note there um, we also have mono legato which um, doesn't re-trigger the envelope the amp or the um, filter envelope on each hit so get our attack on the first note but the sustained notes are not um, giving us any click only when we release are we going to get a click 
and we can set the um, note priority to different things so we can have it to low note priority that means that um, the lowest note we're playing is always going to be the one that we're hearing and I'd have to play a lower note to hear something else uh, high means the high one is always going to be the priority and you also have uh, last that middle note there because it's the one I most recently played is the one that has priority and then that one and then that one back down at the bottom uh, last is usually why I have it set to this is especially cool um, when we are using uh, Portamento as well sounds a lot more natural cool uh, yeah I was just saying I, I'd quickly show you the uh, the difference with the LFO here. So if I just put on some pitch, just went past it, didn't I? Pitch all, there we go, a little bit of pitch modulation. You can hear there maybe that the um, pitch wobble there is kind of playing off against itself and it's creating this nice chorusing thing which may be exactly what you're looking for in a lot of cases if we set the play mode to poly with mono lfo it basically means that there's one lfo shared across this entire track rather than one per voice and that should mean that we always get a very well defined vibrato across these notes rather than Let's mess them up by doing this. It's subtle, uh, but for certain patches, it's definitely going to be useful, I think. So anyway, I hope you enjoyed the video and that uh, you found it useful. Uh, maybe it introduced some uh, some concepts that were new to you that will help you finesse some of the arrangements uh, on your digger tone. Uh, this sort of voice management stuff, it really is kind of the the, the fine tuning that um, certainly more um, involved arrangements often need just to make them work in exactly the way that you expect them to work. So um, certainly learning about the voice allocation um, has been really useful to me in sort of more densely packed uh, arrangements. If you did enjoy the video, uh, it would be truly wonderful if you could leave it a, a like. And also, uh, if you're not already, make sure you subscribe to the channel for more synthesis stuff. Uh, inevitably more Digitone and Digitap because I can't quit them because they are wonderful, wonderful instruments. Uh, but uh, there'll also be some videos uh, around the modular coming up, um, probably an APZ video as well. And I'm hoping to get my hands on at least one new synth uh, in the next few weeks uh, that I'm very excited to start digging into on the channel as well so um, keep your eye out for that. As always thank you so much for joining me until next time take care bye bye